Hello, my name is Dick Moore. I live here in Berwick, Maine. And today we are speaking to our special guest who is Daniel Flint. Dan is from uh, Sanford, Maine. And Dan, tell us a bit about yourself. Well, okay, Dick. I grew up here in uh, Berwick. Uh, I was born in Rochester, New Hampshire. I grew up in Berwick. I graduated from Noble High School uh, back in, uh, in 1975. Uh, since then, I, I, I've married the prettiest girl from North Brook, <laughs> and we reside in, in Sanford, Maine now. Uh, I've had three children, and I got four grandchildren. Wow. So everybody seems to be healthy, so we're doing pretty good. Well, that's great. Yeah. Uh, tell us a bit about your service record. So, as my service record, uh, I, I, I joined the New Hampshire Army National Guard. And again, I was still in high school when I did that. Uh, if you, uh, I wanted to join the Navy, but my father wouldn't have it. Uh, and I have a picture of him right there. He, uh, he was in the unit with my uh, two uncles. And later, I had uh, two more uncles on my other side of my family in there. So it was a family affair. And uh, he, he kind of talked me into joining the National Guard, which I, I don't have any regrets from it. Um, but I didn't, chan I didn't get a chance to sail the ocean blue, but <laughs> I kind of did in a lot of ways, I guess. So uh, how long were you in the service? I, was, I, I, I joined and never got out, so it was, uh, I, I served 41 years. Wow. For, for the New Hampshire Army National Guard. I see that you achieved the uh, rank of command sergeant major there. Well, That's it, it, took, it took a long time, but yes, I did. I was fortunate enough that I, I stayed uh, employable, you know. I mean, I, I stayed in shape. I did what they asked me to do. And uh, lo and behold, everything fell into place. Wow. I've had... Uh, I've had Numerous uh, assignments with inside the organization, you know, different units. I, the first unit was a uh, service battery, 197th Field Artillery, right here, uh, right across the bridge in New Hampshire, in Summersworth, New Hampshire. Huh. I stayed there for about, I guess it was nearly 18 years. Wow. It drew down. I ended up in the 3643rd. It was a uh, GS company. That drew down. <laughs> And it, uh, it reclassified itself, and it went into Klexif and classification, 3643rd, and I was, I was, I was serving there, uh, became a first sergeant in that unit, and shortly after that, it reclassified again, and it went into uh, uh, the Brigade Support Battalion. Sure. It was, a, it was a, an organization that, that supported the, the battalion, I mean the brigade, supported the brigade out of New Hampshire, and I also, Served in the brigade headquarters, went overseas with them, and uh, the 3643rd, yeah. I've been all over New Hampshire, mostly on the seacoast and Manchester and Concord. Okay. Now, I understand Command Sergeant Major is the highest rank you can achieve as an enlisted man. Uh, as an enlisted man, yes. Yeah. Yeah, in an organization. You're usually, you're usually working for a, a battalion commander or, or a colonel, a full colonel or something like that, yeah. I see. Or general. I see. Mine, I was a, a battalion, so I worked for a lieutenant colonel. I see. And I also was a sergeant major before, before that, and I was a, uh, in the G4 section, which is a supply uh, quartermaster. So I came, from, I came out of that to be a command sergeant major. It's a different, uh, it's the same pay grade, but it's just a different uh, duty position. Were you... Drafted or did you enlist? You must oh, have enlisted. Oh, I enlisted. Uh, the draft, I think, went out in uh, 72, if my memory is correct. Uh, it's been a volunteer army ever since, uh, which is a pretty cool thing, if you ask me. What, why did you join the service? Well, I, like I say, I wanted, I wanted to experience it. My father did it. My uncle did it. You know, uh, I got... I got bombarded all the time. Sure. I say, what are you going to do after school, you know? I figured I'd, get, I'd give it a shot. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I did support it all my life. I mean, I did, even in the, in the trying times in the 70s was a tough time, but, but then again, I, 
I didn't, uh, I didn't go down that road. I stayed with uh, defending this, uh, this country and something I wanted to do. So one way or the other, and one organization or the other, right. I was going to do it. So I guess, I guess I just wanted to do it to say that I did it. <laughs> you know? I didn't realize I would take it this long. but Okay, okay. So why did you pick the uh, Army instead of like Navy, Air Force, Marine? Well, I said I wanted to go in the Navy. I talked about it with my father. And he said, well, why don't you just try us? You know, and it was my father's in there. My uncle Dan was in there and his twin brother. And, oh, my gosh, you know, I'd feel like I was disowning my family, so I jumped in. I tried it, you know. It, it's, it's, uh, I, I'd come in as a mechanic, uh, a wheel vehicle mechanic, and they put me on a record with my, my father was on it with me. So it, we, got to, we got to do some pretty cool things together. Well, that's great. Uh, shortly you will get into your service record and places you went and so forth, but right now I'd like to talk about your early days in the service. Like, uh, do you recall your first days in the service, like your first week or so, and what it was like? Well, I joined high school. I mean, I, I, I didn't have any idea what to really expect. I know I listened to my father and my uncles, and, and uh, yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's exciting, but it's also a little scary, you know. I was intimidated by yeah. anybody in a uniform. I mean, yeah. but uh, I guess it was uh, more exciting than it was intimidating. Yeah. I so, couldn't wait to get going, actually. Yeah, so intimidating would have been like during your boot camp yeah, in the early yeah, days. Yeah, they tried to, you know, boot camp is good. Do you remember any interesting experiences you had in boot camp? Well, yeah, I do. I do. First day I got there, I, I, I really thought about opening the window and taking off again because it was pretty rough. <laughs> then, then I... Then, then I don't like to quit anything, so I kept going. Um, I remember, I remember my drill sergeant. You know, Sakina, his, it was name, real short guy, shorter than me actually. And uh, he said I was a little overweight, which it was. And he, and by the time I uh, graduated from that, he fixed that all up. He gave me a red vest, and all I did was run. Yeah. You know, as a road guard. So he, he took care of that short time. But, you know, it was one of my proudest moments I ever had in my life when I graduated from that place. Oh. I only wish my parents were there to witness it. That's wonderful. Uh, you know, so so I felt good after that, and I, I don't think I ever looked back, but, you know, I hope That's I answered your question. But. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was there anything special that took a uh, mental adjustment for you to, to get through it? Was there any time where you really wanted to give it up and stuff, or...? In basic training? Yeah. Wow, you're talking a long time. Uh, I can't say no, no. No? I mean, I, I was abused. I mean, I've, they, they try to make you quit. Oh, sure. Now, that's what it's all about, all right? So, yeah. So, but when they, they break you down and build you up, that's what I like about it, all right? So, no, I didn't, I never really wanted to quit. I wanted, I missed my girlfriend, yeah. <laughs> you know, it was my wife now, but yes, I missed her dearly. And I really thought about a lonely night on guard duty. I said, boy, it'd be nice just to give this up, but, but I didn't do it. I didn't, I didn't even get to the next step. Okay, so after that you graduated and uh, you were off. Tell us some about over the years, of course, 41 years I know is a long time, but why don't you run through a basic, uh, you know, resume, so to speak. Of, okay, of well, like I say, I, uh, I was, I'm a mechanic. Uh, I, worked, I worked in uh, Sanford when I graduated from base training as a mechanic. I worked at uh, Tibbetts Garage. It was a, a Datsun Cadillac garage. Which is pretty cool. Sure. Uh, and then, then I moved over here to to Summersworth. Uh, worked on uh, Dotson's over there, Dotson dealership, which turned into be Nissan. Still there today, just up the road a little ways. And probably along about 83, uh, 82, 83, I was uh, offered a, a full-time job with the New Hampshire Army National Guard as a mechanic, which the job I was doing on the part-time side you know, my weekend drills. So I applied for that, and lo and behold, they gave me the job. And that was, you know, so, so that was my career as a, a mechanic working on the equipment uh, all the way until I gave it up in 2016. So I had something like 33 years of federal service, all told. But 41 years in the guard, if that makes sure. any sense. So I had two jobs, in fact, you know. 
So as a mechanic, what type of equipment did you work? Oh gosh, well, we had, <laughs> that's a pretty good story. Well, I started out with stuff dating back to 1950. That, that record right there, and that picture is, is a 1953, uh, I believe, record. And we still use that up uh, to, to the 90s. It was refitted, finally. But it was equipment like that. Jeeps, remember the old Jeeps? Okay. Uh, we worked on the Jeeps. We had, uh, we had uh, five-ton trucks. We, had, we was field artillery, so we, we had five-ton trucks towing a 155-millimeter a uh, uh, cannon. All right, so, but everything was usually uh, the newest stuff. We got pickups, uh, Dodge pickups come in to the scene in, uh, you know, uh, mid-'80s. You know, and then they turn over to the General Motors uh, Blazers and pickup trucks. And, and lo and behold, around, I don't know, it must have been 2005, I come home from overseas, and my goodness, we had, we had more equipment than, than you could use, it seems so, that we had people to use, but brand new stuff. It just went from, to me, it was like, it seemed like it was overnight. I know we've had a little bits in here and there, but, but the masses came after that. They started to put the, the stuff that we would fight with in our units. Sure. And it took decades because I was, I was in that era. And it took a long time. You know, it's, something's changed. You ask for it and you get it. So, so we got all brand new hammocks and, 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 and uh, LMTVs, light vehicles, you know, to support it. Humvees. Brand new stuff. Plastic still on the seats, you know. That's what I came home to in uh, 2005, the first time, or four, I guess it was. And it's still there today, so it wasn't just a, a one-time shot, you know. Yeah. It constantly changes. Can you tell me about a couple of your most memorable experiences while you were in service? Well, yeah. You know, I, I served in the National Guard for, I don't know, it must have been, phew, I dare say almost 30 years without doing, I went training, I did all that. We did the Cold War thing, all that stuff. And one day I was, uh, I was getting ready for training, I was eyeing in my uniforms of all things, looking at the TV. And, you know, a few years prior to that, I talked my, my own kids, I said, go, go in the Navy, go in the Air Force. And they ended up going in the Army for whatever reason, all right? But I watched my kid, I want my youngest, well, my middle kid, Danny. He went, uh, I was watching it on CNN News. And they were getting ready to go into Iraq. And here I am sitting here training, you know. They didn't sit very good with me, you know. And then my daughter told me she got her orders a little bit after Danny. So... You know, it, it bugged me for a while. It bugged me for a while, and I, I itched to go with somebody. You know, whatever I had to do, I'd try to do it. So, but my, my most memory is, is uh, I never got to see my son, because he come out just as I was going in. I did, he did come to Fort Drum when he got out. Yeah. He was on the initial push on Iraqi freedom. And uh, Manda was over there. That's Manda right there. And one of my fondest memories is the, uh, going to find her when I got over there. Wow. I mean, it was happened by chance. I mean, you just don't move around where you want to go. Yeah. But we had business in Baghdad, and uh, that's where she was. And my boss sent me up there to take care of that business and because uh, he knew she was up there. So I always appreciate that. <laughs> and I did find her. I had some time. Oh, that's great. A little bit of time, and I, f I found her unit where she was. Sure. And uh, we visited. So I, I never, I never forget that it was Mother's Day, and we're trying to, to call my wife or a mother, uh, and we're sitting in a bunker because we getting, they were getting mortared somewhere. So they did a line, we're sitting there at night trying to call on this GI phone, some kind of satellite phone that's supposed to connect you. It was, it was very difficult, it took a long time, but I know, I'll never forget that. <laughs> and my boss, with time to time, was sending me back up there. You know, whatever kind of business we was doing, legitimate business. And uh, so I, I, I think I bumped into her about three times, four times. Before she, she left the country. So I finally got what I asked for. You know, I mean, it's just by chance. I mean, you, you can't just get on anybody's 
boat and go over. You know, you gotta have a, yeah. a unit, a mission. Yeah. You know, so 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 I was I was uh that was one of my fondest memories, just to meet her. Uh, I see you've got quite a row of medals and citations and what the service normally calls fruit salad. I think yeah, yeah. fruit salad. Right. Yeah, but well, uh, again, I had a long, a longevity. Okay, I've been in it a long time. I've never laid down. Never got lazy. All right, I did what they asked me to do. I took on the missions I had to take on, and and they they rewarded me for it. Well, I would medals. I got. I think my my highest medal was a, was a and I got on my last day in boots. Uh, it's a, a Legion of Merit, they call it. Ah. And if you read the citation, it's it's it spans over a whole career. You know, I've been a first sergeant for three times, three different units, and a sergeant major, and a and a command sergeant major. And not to mention, even way before that, as a E7 level platoon sergeant, you know, detachment sergeant. So I, I try to do and reclassified myself like four times, so I could have be uh, I don't know, mar you know be uh, you know be able to do the jobs they wanted me sure, to do. Sure. So all I did was do my job. You know, uh, I, got, I did get a bronze star for my second. It was during my second tour. I've been overseas three times. Uh, I was in a. a we, uh, I was in a uh, theater internment facility. It's a detainee operations. Okay, we had like nearly four thousand detainees in there, and something like four hundred guards. And I was the non-commissioned officer in charge of the guard force. And my job was to keep order and discipline with inside that uh, that in internment facility. And we had many times we had riots and trying to get out and all these things. And uh, they gave me, uh, you know, I did that job the whole entire, entire time I was over there. And, and my commander wrote me out for a bronze star for my actions during those times. Wow. To keep, uh, to keep the discipline and uh, keep, keep the, headquarters, the headquarters involved because I, I was the eyes out on the TIF. I was the one running around making sure the guards were doing what they're supposed to do and the detainees were doing what they're supposed to do. Sure. So. It was a, it was a, that was a tough, tough time. The rest, you know, you get from being a first sergeant or, or uh, you know, you get over time, achievement medals, and, which is, it's all good. But my highest one was good the last day, and that was for a span over 40, over 40 years. I, I know you're being modest when you say just doing my job, and I appreciate you know, I can I, I can appreciate that. I work for good I work for good officers, all right, most of my career. Yeah. And uh, you know, and a good soldier told told me if you want to be successful, surround yourself with good people. Yeah. That's exactly what I did. <laughs> you know, I learned from them all. I know what right was and what wrong looked like, and and you mold yourself into to what looks good. And then you know what. You know, the National Guard is a small organization, and each state has one, you know, so we compete with each other. Although we can go out of state, we can go anywhere, sure. you know, but for, for the most part, if you're doing the right things, you get noticed, and, and you keep your points up and keep yourself right. that next step that you need to do. Sure. That's all you need to do, and just do what a soldier does, do what the dog when they're told to do it. I noticed that you have one ribbon on the, on the right-hand side, just below a badge there, a, a red one. What, what is That's that? That's a, a military service for a unit. I was in a unit. Oh, a unit uh, award. That won that award. Okay. Right? So, yeah, and that was, uh, there's actually two, two units. The for, uh, but yes, that's a unit award. It's not an individual. Everything else on that side is individual. So, in your 40 plus years of service, uh, you must have gone overseas. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, first time was uh, two, uh, uh, four and five, 2004 and five. Again, Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, I was with the brigade headquarters. I was a senior uh, uh, motor sergeant, you want to call it. I was an E8 in the brigade. I was a master sergeant in the brigade uh, headquarters. 
out of New Hampshire, stationed in Manchester, New Hampshire. I went overseas with them uh, the first time. And then I come back out of there and I, I went I went back because I was the first sergeant of 3643rd when I got the call. Maybe they wanted me over there. So I went over there and I come back and said, well, you might, might want to get your old job back. I went back and got it. So, but it was a different unit. It was a different mission, sure. which is it's cool, you know. Yeah. But, uh, so, so I went back, and lo and behold, they get they get the call go over. So, uh, so wow, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going, I'm going again. That's when we went in 2005. Uh, uh, well, I was six and seven. All right, it was like a 15 month deployment. That was a long one because I had a lot of getting ready to do. And that was on Iraqi freedom. That's when I ended up in uh, in Baghdad in that TIF, uh, uh, in the in detainment operations. Uh, we was formed as a, as a security company, so they put us in there, which is not a big deal. Um, and then I came out of that, and what the heck? Did I, oh, I went to I went to uh, 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 to be a first sergeant. In, in the battalion, brigade support battalion headquarters. So yeah, so I went there, and guess what? We won again. So, uh -huh. so, uh, but this time I was I was sliced off. I it was it, it turned into be uh, Operation New Dawn, and that was uh, uh, ten and eleven, ten through eleven, and that was a year long uh, deployment. And I got uh, I got detailed off with a bunch of about sixteen of us. And we work, well, we work for the brigade headquarters, but the 197th, that's this, this, this badge right here with the arrows. Um, and I went up and uh, I worked for a DPW. It was an awesome mission. I loved it. I had a, I really, I pinched myself, you know, because I, I had a good job. And uh, we stayed in Kuwait and we managed, I worked for a colonel that managed all those northern camps. Oh, really? Yeah, he took care of them all. So, so I worked for DPW. We went around and monitored uh, contractors yeah. that were doing certain things, building towers. And wow. Yeah, it was great. And I uh, came home and, uh, you know, I got, I got to the age I probably couldn't, I wouldn't have enough time to, to go again. So I, I retired. I retired actually three, three, uh, nine months early. Wow. I could have taken it more, but it was it was it, it wouldn't have made any difference. I was yeah. doing, holding the slot up. Yeah. You know, I mean, it takes a little bit of the lust out of it, or the luster, <laughs> luster, or whatever you want to call it. But uh, it takes a little bit of, you know, it, it takes the win out of you when you know you're coming up on the end. They won't even let you go if you did get the call. So why should I, you know, hang around? But, and, and and they showed me the money. So sure. So, I mean, I, oh, the three deployments, you know, the country is letting you go a little bit earlier and you're not being punished for it, as long as you've got the time. So, going overseas, what was it like, I mean, arriving there, you know, in a strange world? And yeah. Well, I trained to go over the first time in Fort Drum in January. I can't tell you how cold <laughs> it is in January, all right? Uh -huh. uh, so, I didn't even think the Army would train in that kind of way, but Stu did. Uh, and then next thing you know, I was sitting in Kuwait. I was like, ah, oh, 98, 100 degrees. You know, it, 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 <laughs> it's a little, it's, and you got all that stuff on, and you're trying to lug it. I mean, you know, we went to two extremes. But you know, so so it was a, it was a shock. Was it exciting? Yeah, I mean, I didn't know nothing for nothing. I, mean, I, I didn't know, you know, the layout. I mean, I've I've seen battle plans and all that stuff, but you know, it, it was kind of exciting. Did you have to deal with any of the local civilians oh, there yeah, before? All the time. Well, was there was there a language barrier? Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, my first trip was uh, it was pretty cool. I I, uh, I was working for the brigade headquarters. My boss, uh, the guy in charge of logistics, you know, uh, I had uh, I had to buy things on the economy, and, and uh, they give you cash for it, and then you buy stuff like I don't know. We might have needed a freezer or a printer or Things like that, and I was a I was a paying agent for them, amongst other jobs I did. But that was a, one of the things I thought it was pretty cool. So I, yeah, I dealt with them. You know, you you can usually uh, you get it. The second trip, you know, being being uh, we started ripping, uh, we started uh, having Iraqi uh, correctional officers come in. So yes, I mean I had the sidekick half, half the time. I had them right beside me all the time, and we always had interpreters every time we had to go discipline somebody. Uh, 
or go into the go inside, I had to bring an interpreter. I mean, I don't, I don't know the language, but yeah, but we could we could communicate. All right, I, I they they it's not usually a problem is so much, you know, because uh, we do have a lot of interpreters. Right. And right. And, again, and again, you're in charge, so you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, if we need to move, we'll move. Yeah. So, a little bit more about being overseas. How did you stay in touch with your family? Probably, probably mail and phone and oh boy. things like yeah. that. Yeah, well, they had a thing called Skype. If you get, if you had, this is what the Army does. When I mean, you move in, it gets better and better as time goes on. The Ford operating bases, the bases will get more infrastructure inside it. So, at first, you probably was using a letter. You know, or if you had access to a computer, you could probably send an email, you know, but, but when they started putting towers up for the soldiers and you could buy, you know, like their, their service from them, like we do here, uh, you could have, uh, you know, Joes who spent a lot of time on their laptops, you know, talking to home on, on, on Skype. If you had good reception, you could get Skype. If nothing more, you got email, you know, so... And they had phone centers. That phone centers would come in. Your people would give us phone cards. I mean, pe American people are very generous. Sometimes you ask for stuff, you know. But uh, but that was the way. They had phone centers. You'd go and stand in line, wait to get to use the phone, use it for ten minutes, whatever. Sure. So next 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 one gets a chance. That's great. And, and uh, as it improved, you even have it inside your own organization. So you you could have you had it right there on your area, not the base so much. So yeah. There's ways to communicate, and today it's even getting better. I mean, people walking around with satellite, they walked around with satellite phones, all right, if they allowed you to. Sure. But you got to be careful. You know, you got to be careful what you send back. So, But every soldier... Was anything back. censored? Well, it's not everything censored, but people exaggerate. All these things that come into play. You know, a soldier or a service member has the luxury of knowing the situation, knows all the support, knows all the things that's going on. Right. But your family member doesn't know that. All they know, you're in harm's way. That's all they know. You know, they don't know, they shouldn't know what's going on every day. I mean, just for offset, you know. You can't blab all what you're going to do and when you're going to do it, so it's, so you've got to be careful about that stuff. But you shouldn't exaggerate, and you should tell, you know, you should talk about what, what you can talk about, which is a lot, without, devo you know, devolving the information that, that should be sensitive. And don't inflate it, because they're sitting back. They don't know that, you know, I went downtown today, you know, I got, but you don't, you don't tell them you had all this other stuff with you <laughs> you know i mean you know what i'm saying all the weapons and all yes. that stuff they don't have the they don't have the eyes on the ground it's different it's more stressful for them than it is you i think i know you had something interesting you wanted to talk about when it comes to weapons but we'll get that in a, in a few okay. minutes uh i want to ask you a few things about life in in, in general in the service this can apply to either stateside or overseas and it's just a few things that i think people i know i would be interested in knowing it what was the food like <laughs> well I, I i never complained about it too much i mean cooks you got it you got to take a hat a hat off the cooks i mean the, the the first one's up last one's down all right and it could be raining and what i mean they're up before you are and they go to sleep after you go to sleep because they're preparing for the next day. Are you going to have a gourmet meal out in the middle of the woods when it's raining out? I don't think so. All right. Coffee's probably going to be cold. The eggs are going to be runny. But, but for the most part, they do an awesome job. All right. And if you take it on a base side, it, it's, it's just, it's, it, it's, uh, uh, I don't think you really could want for more food. There's plenty of food, and there's plenty of options. Out in the woods, and you're doing training, or you're fighting out there, you know, you got your MREs, which are very good. Um, if, MREs. You, yeah, is meals ready to eat, I'm okay. sorry. Yeah, meals okay. ready to eat, uh, that's what they, they usually uh, have in training. 
for like your lunch or something. Like is that, that like the old K ration? Yeah, it's, ration yeah, it's, it's better than that. Though. Okay. There's no cans anymore, so everything in a bag. Oh, I mean, you okay. can warm it up. Sure. You know, with a chemical thing. But, yeah. uh, but they're good when you're hungry. If you're not hungry, I don't, I don't know. Maybe it won't taste as good. But, but uh, I don't have any problem. I, I take my hat off because I really have a lot of respect for them because what they do and try to do. There's been some good ones, and then there's been some ones that probably don't have their heart all the way in it. You know, it's just a job. Yeah, we get that everywhere. But for the most part, the Army take care of you. So the Army always gave you plenty of supplies and stuff you need from personal yeah. to... Well, when it started out in the, in the National Guard, you know, but not so much. But, you know, you always got something that, I don't know, it's kind of secondhand. It was always secondhand, but, but now, nowadays, no, you get, you get everything. You get everything you're authorized, according to regulations. There, there's, there's some there's structure to that. You, know, so you just don't get anything you want. You know, you got to be authorized for yeah. to get it. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, for the most part, you know, uh, uh, our leaders get what we need. Great. You may, they can always improve your life. Yes, they can. <laughs> All right. But careful what you wish for, because you either got to wear it or put it up or use it. So, <laughs> yeah. And it's usually heavy. So, in the service in your off time, how, how do people entertain themselves? Oh, yeah. Uh, on, uh, on, uh, let's say, well, I'll stay on deployments, all right? Inside those camps, those big camps like Buring and Camp Virginia, they have a, an MWR section. Yeah. They had a, uh, morale and welfare uh, sections. Okay. They do all kinds. Your chaplains come in to play a lot. Ah. Uh, they have a lot of activities for for Joes that, that have got some time on their hands, you know, if you're spiritual or if not. I mean, they got, they got all kinds of things going all the time. The MWR sections, they have movies. They got places to hang out, play pool. If you got a pool, they got gyms, gymnasiums. Oh, my God. Yeah, those are, those are the established bases, all right? So, and there's, there's actually GIs watching that. I mean, they're, they're soldiers that are dedicated, they're, they're, that's why they're there is to organize and make sure this stuff works. Okay. And people do have things to do. They do have. Okay. They, I've, I've seen them race cars in the desert, you know, those little remote control ones. They had a heck <laughs> of a track out there. One, one, one of those camps, I, it was pretty interesting. But, this, you know, do you have all day to do it? No, maybe, you know. It, it's in their best interest to give soldiers downtime, yes. Yeah. yeah. And, of course, they got their laptops. And if they got the Internet, well, you know, the world's open to you. Right. And it's training. You still train. You go to NCO schools. or You can do all kinds of stuff when you're on a big base. You're on a base. Established one. But when you're on a big push like that, there's none of that. It's MREs every day. and You know, you don't have a big base. So it's, it's always that. It's not always like that. You have to earn that real estate. So you, you have to get it. So you didn't always have a mess hall available. <laughs> uh, I, I did, yeah. I was oh, fortunate. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Tell me a little bit, I'm really curious about, uh, when you talk about entertaining yourself, how you fellas, you, you know, all your servicemen in together hand, handled, you know, like, did you play any jokes, jokes or, pranks. Oh or pranks or anything like that? You're talking, I, you're talking, you know. to, yeah, there's some like, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, some I'm really not too proud about, but, um, <laughs> It's not bullying. I wouldn't call it bullying. Yeah, we, we live tight together. All right. I was the like my first trip was like, it was six of us in one tent. You know, that's where we 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 stayed, and we all worked together. We worked for the same same officer, uh, and uh, I, we had one one guy in our tent. I called him the Bubble Boy because in the middle of the tent he had all kinds of like curtains around his bunk and stuff. You never know if he was home or not. You know. Uh, so we, we nicknamed him the Bubble Boy. Well, we're going to set him up one day, and, and we're going, we always teasing him, doing something with him, with each other, too. And uh, we're going to work, we're walking, and, and lo and behold, we find uh, a briar on the, on the ground. <laughs> okay, but hang on. Now, everybody has to bring their laundry to a, a facility. They run, you know, they, they take your laundry, and they do it for you. You don't have to do your laundry. Okay. This is even better at home. <laughs> All right? So, but you have to dump it out. And this big table in front of everybody, you know, you're all lined up. And they, they give you a receipt for it. They count your underwear. And I said, so we picked that up. And that, that night we, 
come home and put it in his laundry bag. The brat? Yeah. We stuffed it in his laundry bag. Because <laughs> he's a pretty shy kid to start with, right? So we, we usually do things together. So we'll go on laundry mat, we're all lined up, and he dumps all his stuff out. And there it was. He had no idea how that got there. And we're looking at it and say, oh boy, what are you doing in that bubble, you know? But, uh, so, so, but there was always a practical joke going on. I could probably be, this, this, there was never, I, I don't think we ever, we've always had discussions or we're playing pranks on, oh, one night, I'll tell you, this was another thing. You gotta listen to your intelligence sometimes, all right? They warned us about grasshoppers in the desert, all right? They're gonna come, grasshoppers are coming. You mean the insects, real yes, grasshoppers? Yes, let's talk okay. about grasshoppers. You know? Now we're sleeping in a tent. And uh, they give us a, the army has, they, they, they give us a, a nice screen to put over your bunk so you, you don't have to deal oh, with Oh sure, it. like a netting. Yeah, it's a netting. And they said, you better put them up, they're grasshoppers. And my buddy's in the tent, you know, I said, they ain't no grasshoppers in the desert, there's no grass. So, but there was a couple of us listened to our intelligence and we put it up. Well, then what about a day later? I, I've never seen so many insects in my life come in. And you, I don't care what you do, your tent is going to get in there. There are thousands of them. And we're laying, I'm laying in my bunk and I was teasing them all night. So, Ooh, look at the side of that one. And they're beating them <laughs> off and trying to get. <laughs> I had such the best, that was the best night I've had over there. To watch the, 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 the grasshoppers eat Louis Sanfison and a bunch of other guys in there. It was so funny. But, and then of course we teased them about it. Movies, you know. My, my second trip over, well I had it in my walk. I don't know if I can show it to you or not, but I can try. So my job, my second trip over, my job was to walk around, make sure Joe's doing what they're supposed to do. You know, behaving, staying on guard, staying awake, doing, being sharp, you know. Okay, yeah. And uh, I talked to every, each and every one of them guys. Oh, yeah, girls too, but most of them. I had, they had a guy over there, uh, with, I nicknamed him Smiley. This guy could, you, could, you, you couldn't feed, the, if you didn't feed this guy in three days, you'd still be smiling. I mean, this is what his attitude was. He was from Virginia or someplace. And, uh, well, he showed me a picture of his girl he was going to marry when, as soon as he gets home on leave. And I'm looking at him and looking at that girl. I says, yeah, it's, it ain't making sense. I mean, wh what are they seeing? I mean, I know he's got a good personality. and said, well, that's probably what it was. But he was all excited. I said, well, you know, I've been married 45 years, or 30 years, I should say. So I showed him a picture of my wife. And I, I don't think this is a bad thing because we had so much fun with it. So I give him this picture. And, and for the first time, I said, well, that's my wife. I've been married 35 years. And the first time, I never see him smile. He smiled well, then, because I picked up one. I knew it was going to happen. So I, uh, of course, I, I gave him some crap about that. You know, I said, well, where's your smile now, buddy? You know, all this <laughs> stuff. So he took it serious. You know, but I would, I would pull that out sometimes, a good, good time, have fun. We were always playing a joke on somebody. There's always something going on. I mean, if you don't, I mean, you, get, you just get... You just get wrapped up in everything. It's just, I, I can imagine you have you to. Know, you know, laughter have to and, that up. and yeah. yeah, laughter. If you don't have that, you're gonna. I don't think you're gonna have a nervous breakdown. Probably. I don't know. You gotta have something. Could you tell us a little bit about some of these pictures you've got here uh, between well, us? Well, that's my father. I think we went over that. That's my son. He was in Iraq. What? What? Well, he got out before I got in. This is when I met my daughter overseas. When we was in Baghdad at that time. I got this thing. Believe it or not, I'm not my comfort uh, cow. I don't, I'm not that type of guy, but I think my mother gave me this. We was in a bunch of people together. She says, why don't you take that with you? So I took this thing everywhere I went, uh, especially, well, every trip. It was with me. I had to have it. Sure. Any kind of picture or something, I'd have it stuck somewhere, and you could find them. The kids would find it, find that thing in the picture. It could be, could be sitting over there or something. I always made a point to put that thing somewhere. <laughs> so, they, so they knew I took it with me. I had a little accident there one day. But, so it's been, it's been all over. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of places in Iraq. And, kind of a good luck or a sentimental type, type thing? Yeah, it's mm -hmm. my comfort. I didn't sleep with it or anything, but, but uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, was probably, it was probably nearby. So. But okay. yeah, I took it. And you know what? They, they, every time I went over, someone gave me something else. So I had like a little farm, farm stand going. I had sheep and, and some kind of goat thing that my buddy's girl gave me, daughter gave me. So yeah, I did that. That's, that's what I'm saying that once the kids, the kids ever see this, 
thing they're going to say, well, there's, there's Rex right there, you know. And that's the way it went. But there was always somebody getting set up for something. Those, uh, there, there's a lot more, but we don't have all that time. But. So being in the service as long as you were and, and traveling overseas, I'm, sh I'm sure sooner or later you must have had exposure to probably most of the weapons in the uh, Army's arsenal. What is the most powerful weapon that you ever had to do with in the service? Well, the most powerful weapon. Well, you got to look at the United States Navy because them aircraft carriers pack a lot of stuff and and they don't travel alone. You know, if you look around, there's all kinds of warships and there's some you can't see. They're under the, under the ocean. Right. You never know where they are. So when you talk about weapons, you better be thinking about the United States Navy. And then you can concentrate on the closest relative is the Marines. And they got a, a, a rifle that's very accurate, very durable. They got it, plenty of them. So you got to think about that. I mean, it's small, but it's big. And don't forget to look up. Because you got a B-2 bomber somewhere in the sky all the time. You never know where they are. They're too high. It's probably classified. I don't know. Uh, and don't talk about those F-15s and 16s they got flying around. But all they bring. So you got to think about that. And then you look over to the Army. You know, it's kind of a collection of all of it in one degree or another. So you, you think about the Abrams tank and the... And the uh, the awesome artillery they can bear on you. That's that's impressive. Of course, then you got a Coast Guard. I always like Coast Guards. Coast Guards serves with us too. They're there. And they go out and they, their equipment is designed to check for mines and they go out into a force that you can't defeat, Mother Nature itself. So, so you, you got to think about all those things, but that's not what I'm thinking about. Uh, what I'm thinking about is, it's uh, this weapon requires endless fuel, and and it's got to be abundant, and it it takes it takes constant care, 24/7, to maintain it, and not only that, this this weapon can think for itself sometimes. All the time, it can be, it gets, it can be affected by everything, from the weather to the temperature, the things happening around around it. it it's affected. It gets affected by it. efficiency can drop off, or it can increase. You know that that. That weapon I'm talking about, if you haven't guessed this, this is an American soldier. And I'm not talking about just the Army soldier. I'm talking about, I'm talking about uh, uh, the whole force, the Navy, the Army, the Marines, the Air Force, Coast Guard, all working on one thing, all right? All working on the same sheet of music, okay? That, that is a weapon. That is a weapon that's, that's uh, it probably puts the fear in the rest of them. The rest of our any of our enemies. It's not the hardware. It's the one using that hardware. Now, you can take it a little bit deeper, and I, and I should, I need to say this. Uh, you know, uh, what fuel, what, I mentioned the fuel. What's this fuel? Where's this ammo? You know, you get that from us. Us meaning all of us. All of us who didn't put the uniform on. All of us that did for a short time, out. Oh, we need, it needs loyalty. It needs, it feeds off pride. It, feel, it feeds off uh, being united. If you have all this stuff, those soldiers, you know, un unconditional support, that's what I want to say. If you get the support of us, meaning all of us here, whether you serve or not, you will keep pumping that fuel and you'll be able to deliver it so they can do their job. And that is what they really ought to fear. 
It's not just the service member. It's the ones that love them and support them. Because without that, and think about it, without that support from all of us, you know, serving may not, it's volunteer. Remember we say it was volunteer army? Yes. It, it probably won't be as uh, appealing to do it or to continue to do it where you have experience. Okay? So, so I encourage, you know, uh, we got to look and always, you know, what's the most, you know what the best thing I ever, and I'll say it, I've said it before, you know, mm -hmm. what, what's it mean to serve? I'll tell you, you know, you go down, walk down, take a walk by a schoolyard on a brisk October morning and listen to them kids playing. And you look up there and you see that American flag flying above that schoolyard and for what it stands for and how it got there and what, what keeps it there, you know. That stand is just invisible. That's the fuel that those soldiers and warfighters need. They just need the support. Yeah, they need the hardware, but they need it from us, all of us, united under one flag. And you'll you'll get you will we will maintain that we will this this land won't ever turn into a a disaster with tyranny and poverty and fires and all these things that war give you. All right, nobody's going to jump out of a plane and come get us because we are too. If long as we're we're united, we will have the war fighting equipment and the people behind it to deliver it as long as we can stay together. And that's what it means to me. And when every time I hear those kids playing on a free nation as we enjoy now, take it for granted, we do, I do, time to time, you know. It's the way things are, should be. Well, there's a lot of people that's gone now, that stood in, you know, that stood in front of tyranny to, to stop it, to stop the spread of war socialism and all those things that come come to us you know but war brings if you ever been to a war zone you see you see you never want it in your own country so keep keep it up we're doing good i think we're doing good we're worse than one percent but are we are we you know less than one percent put the uniform on that's what it's figured out to be that's scary in a way so how many how many more can we lose so we need to keep it going, keep that pride and that loyalty and that duty, a sense of duty, and, and, and unify, unify, keep it unified. Wow. We'll be fine. Wow. So it's really, it's really us is the weapon. Great. The rest of it's just metal and plastic. Oh, we... Oh, wow. Uh, that's, uh, that's how I think of it. Well, thank you so much. That's... That's kind of profound, really. Uh, today we're interviewing Dan Flynn from Sanford, Maine, retired Command Sergeant Major, U.S. Army, and I'm Dick Moore, your uh, host for today. And we're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back with you in a few minutes. Thank you. Okay, so Dan, uh, do you recall the day that you got out of the service and, and how that went? Was it, how, how did it feel, you know? Oh, boy, and they read that order to me, and I was in a drill hall. They had, a, had all my family there, and, you know, once it became a reality, and it did, you know, they read the order and say, and I retired, officially retired. You know, it, it, it uh, that bugged me for a little bit. I had to collect myself. Uh, that's been my life, you know. It's almost like it's a part of your life that's ended, but I must, you know, once you get 20 years <laughs> and, and, and boots, so what, you're a soldier or a sailor for life. They don't go away. So, so it's pretty cool. Yeah, I didn't. I, it bugged me. It sure did. I mean, but it has to come sooner or later. Oh, you get too old. I know. <laughs> so what did you do in the days and weeks immediately afterward? Oh, God, yeah. I thought, uh, I don't know. I... I, I keep busy. I got. Uh, I married a farmer, so the the work keeps coming. Um, 
I got, you know, I, I, I play in my garage a lot. You know, I rebuild Jeeps, I take care of family's cars, do all kinds of things. I'm, I'm busy. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I never went to work for nobody, no. I, I, I've never worked for anybody. I thought about it. But, sure, okay. But uh, I, do I travel and do everything I, I dreamed about when I was working? No. <laughs> uh, but someday, hopefully, I, I'll work on my bucket list. But. So... Did you uh, make any close friendships while you were in the oh, service yeah, that, yeah. that you continue today? I, I call them battle buddies, you know. Yeah. That's what we call them. Uh, yeah. I mean, I got lifelong friends. So I live right here in this town. I grew up in this town. You know, Lenny Rendell was one of them. Like, he was like a brother to me. We served together for a long time in the New Hampshire Army National Guard. Uh, and he retired, I can't remember the date, but he had like 20, 24 years or so service. A lot of it was full time for him, uh, you know. Do I, do I, I made you know the last trip out? Uh, boy, it was just me and that guy, you know, another guy, and we, we're real close. I mean, do I see each other? No, I mean, we seen. I live in Sanford, Maine. He lives someplace in southern New Hampshire. Sure. So I mean, so no, we don't see each other. I, I plan on going hunting with one of them coming up this this November. So that'd be pretty good. I just talked to him this morning. <laughs> So, uh, so yeah. Great. I keep, I keep, I go to reunions if I can, if I can make one. We do have one other, uh, the brigade headquarters has one that's coming up. Well, you know what? I'm going to miss that one, but, uh, but I've been to them. Uh, those are good times. Yeah, you, you make lifelong friends in the military. I mean, it's a team. It's like being a part of a baseball team or a football team or something. That's what it's, uh, that's what it's really about. So yeah, do you do you love everybody that you worked with? Probably not. I mean, that's, I'm, I'm not gonna lie to you, but uh, we have a lot of friends. A lot. We, as a matter of fact, every Wednesday, every Wednesday that I can, uh, we meet. Uh, we used to meet at my father's house, and he passed away. We meet down at uh, Lenny Rendell's house now. So we got we got some old boys that come in there, and we probably share the same old stories again and again. But but uh, we still keep in touch and. In the National Guard, in the New Hampshire Army National Guard, coming up in September, it's an annual thing. They have all the retirees come and guests. Civilian, if they worked as a civilian, it's fine. And they have a they have an orientation to tell you what what's going on in the guard today. What's what's new? What's exciting? Where's the units been? You know. And they uh, we have a cookout, and and we get the chance to see all those, the the the, the people you served with so many years. You know, because they, they keep coming. So it keeps growing and growing. I think we're over 250 or so now. I mean, it, it, it's pretty cool. Yes, you stay in touch. You make lifelong friends, solid friends. That's great. I wonder, uh, excuse me, I understand that you're a member of a local veterans organization. Oh, yeah. Uh, Charles H. Hatch, uh, Post 79, Brewer, Maine. I'm, very, I'm a proud member of that. And I've always, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a kind of a young member. I didn't join until after I really got out to put some time in it. But, um, but we, you know, Memorial Day, since I can remember, uh, they do amazing things for veterans. They bent over backwards. If some veteran needs hand, they just need to reach out. In the community, same way. Uh, they do amazing things here in Burke, a little post like that, and we're, we're, we're getting larger all the time. So they support our communities. They, the, uh, you know, at the a veteran uh, final hours, I mean, they're no longer with us, you know, at least they get some kind of, sometimes that's all there is. The family, you know, you get an old soldier that passes away, you know, all their, their friends are probably sure. gone, and all these things, but the American Legion, Post 79 Brook will show up and they'll, uh, they'll give them a good, good sound off. So I like that. See, yeah. that's the part I like. As far as, you know, there's no club here in Brook. We, we meet right right next door here and, and where we, you go get your registrations, you know. We put tables, I mean, chairs up and stuff. But, but it's good. It's great. You know, and it's growing all the time. And I got a lot of guys I serve with that's in there. So. Any idea how many membership you have right now? How many? Oh, God, I won't guess, but. Uh, I, I, it's well over 50. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, it's up there. I mean, I've never seen them all together all the time, 
but I've seen that that whole place get full. Does it just cover people living in Berwick, or is no, it all over? Uh, no, I live in Sanford. You can belong to any post you want. You can you can you, okay. know, you, you can belong in multiple posts, uh, or at least one post. But you can go to another post's meeting. You just can't vote, you know, stuff. So they do a lot of things for the community. They recognize you probably uh, film some of it. They recognize, uh, uh, you know, people that are doing amazing things in Berwick, whether it's business or a, an individual volunteer at the time. They recognize people, yeah, and they take care of veterans. I would, I would encourage anybody that's, that's done at least one day on active duty to come and, come and talk to us. All they need is a DD Form 214, and uh, we'll have to vote you in, but, you know, I probably, uh, I can't say that anybody ever has any trouble. Sure. All right? So come on, all of you. We need numbers. Open arms, huh? That's it. <laughs> all right. When we do, when you see a parade in Berwick, that's, that's really driven by the American Legion. I mean, I know Brooke does things. You know, Boy Scouts are always there, Girl Scouts, yeah. And the bands, yes. All that stuff. But, you know, we, we, they make a point. They always have. It's nothing new. And that's what I liked about it. So, yeah. Plus, my buddy was in there anyways. That's great. Uh, one of the last things I'd like to ask before we wrap up is, uh, how did your overall experience in the service for that 40 years affect your, your own personal civilian lifestyle and is there anything you can oh, point to that if you was to ask my wife she'd say that i turned angry but i was saw a major so you got right to be angry yeah but uh you know uh it shows up when we go someplace you know i gotta have, i gotta think about it way ahead of time my wife just gets in the car and goes, seems so. So do I think about, yeah, it's structured, okay? If we're gonna go here, we're gonna need these things logistically. We need to get me on here on time, make sure it's loaded, all those types, yeah. I mean, if that affected me, probably the most. I like it, I like to start out ahead of time. So I'm ready when we do execute. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> so yes, the Army did that to me. Yeah, yeah. And it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. I don't. I mean, but she brings it up to me all the time. But <laughs> I don't know. okay, uh, is there anything else that you, you'd like to tell us before we finish up? Well, anything I, we haven't covered? <laughs> yeah, we cover a lot. But um, I would encourage anybody, especially young ones in school, okay, that coming out don't really know what they want to do yet to at least look at the military, talk to your recruiters, talk to people that's been in it, okay? Because if you're not sure what you want to do, you at least might want to check it out. At least you'll get a job. And, you'll, and if you don't take it for a career like I did, you can get out on say three years, four years, and look what you bring to the table. You're coming on. You, you get an honorable discharge, you're coming out drug free. You gotta be drug free, right? You're not in trouble. You know, you got some discipline, right? You're there on time. And you're all, and you're a part of something larger than yourself. So you, can you fit into a company? I dare say you could, because a company is the same thing, it's just smaller, all right? Everybody's working for the same outcome. Either you're making money or you're providing security so they can make money. You see what I'm saying? Yes. So why wouldn't you dare, I always say dare yourself, well my kids did it, you know, dare yourself to fail. And the rest, you know, that don't want to put a uniform on or never have, or never took that step, that's fine. No, nothing wrong with that. You keep supporting that and this, this flag sitting next to me will fly over this nation for, in, for eternity. Well, however long it lasts, all right? But they need, it needs to have two pieces. It needs the warfighter, and it needs a, the one that will support it. Those two things together, dare yourself to fail, you just might make it. You know, an old rock like me made it. It took a while. Was it a struggle? Yes, it was. I'm not telling you it's easy. But, you know, what is? What is? 
All right. All right. So get out there and get involved. And get it going. Well, thank you very much, Dan. Thank you very, very, very much. Oh, you're welcome. I want to yeah. thank you for your many years of service. Right. We appreciate it, was, it was an honor. So we appreciate you coming in here today. Yeah. And, and thank you. Thank you for yours. True. Yeah. Thank you. And all the rest. So today we've been speaking with Dan Flint of Sanford, Maine, retired uh, U.S. Army Command Sergeant Major. I'm Dick Moore, your uh, host for today. I'd also like to thank our director, uh, Terry Wright. You haven't seen her today because she's been behind the camera and doing uh, uh, all of this for us. So uh, thank you, Terry. We appreciate it very much. And uh, with that, we will hopefully, uh, before too long, do, do another uh, interview. Thank you very much. <laughs>